And welcome to a slightly beaten and slightly irregular edition of Ben's Junk. So, a couple of months ago, I started trying to put together a semi-permanent audio recording rig for my, for the last few months now, completely derailed Oddity Archive Incidental Music Project. Well, back in February, I did a Ben's Junk on what was to be effectively ground zero of that setup, and that was on the Behringer Euphoria UMC 404 HD audio interface. Rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? But anyway, in that video, I mentioned that I wanted to have my little rig work in tandem with my old Sony Vio Windows 7 laptop. But I wasn't terribly happy with the Behringer, and I wasn't adapting too well to using Cubase audio software. And I was only using Cubase because Pro Tools, my usual program, just doesn't play too nice on the Vio. Then a borderline disaster struck. The Vio has been acting more and more erratic over the last year, year and a half. Uh, for the longest time, its favorite thing to do was just completely lock up on me. Didn't even have to be online, didn't have to have any programs open, and uh, yeah, it could be 110% idle and it would just freeze on me. In addition, even though I normally keep a laptop fan underneath this thing, it would still overheat anyway, and if it's doing anything that requires any kind of power, it sounds like a rocket that's about to take off. And uh, actually, if you saw the Ask the Archive live stream I did a couple of years ago, I was using the webcam on this, and uh, now you know why it sounded so bad. But uh, this all reached a point where I had to give this thing a full wipe and reinstall if I wanted to salvage it at all. In the process, I figured I'd better try and make this a little more contemporary, so I decided to make it so I could dual boot Windows 7 and 10. It's running 10 right now. But it still likes to act up on me a bit. So, I was already kicking around the idea of ditching the aforementioned Behringer audio interface and just finding an old MacBook and using it strictly offline for recording using my usual Mbox 2 Pro and Pro Tools 10 on it. But when it became obvious that the Vio was never going to be a fully functional machine again, I got the idea to find an old high-end MacBook Pro and dual boot the period appropriate Mac OS, uh, Mountain Lion in this case, and Windows 7. Because I am still doing the regular final edits of Oddity Archive on Windows Movie Maker, the last supported version on Windows 7. Or, I shouldn't say I am, Ed does it. Of course, Ed does it. So, this is what I came up with. I scoured Fleabay for the highest-end, early 2010s MacBook Pro that I could find with an AMD Radeon graphics card, because Pro Tools likes that. It was costly. And as it turned out, the Radeon cards used in these particular MacBooks would go bad and destroy the computer. So it became a game of finding one that had already been serviced accordingly. So what I got was this next to top of the line 2011 model. It wound up being 450 bucks for a nearly decade-old laptop. In addition, uh, I mean, it was nice that it had a solid-state drive in it, but it was only 128 gigabytes, and I've had single archive episodes go beyond that, uh, ones with a lot of raw, uncompressed footage. So, yeah, that was another 200 bucks for a new 2 terabyte SSD 
so I could have one terabyte a piece for Mac and Windows. And then, of course, old Benny Boy, the computer whiz, couldn't figure out how to roll back the operating system to Mountain Lion. So I had to take it to a local computer repair place and try to explain to them what I was doing. But they did it for me, and uh, that was 55 bucks plus another 20 for a new copy of Mountain Lion. By this point, I sold off the Behringer and used the proceeds to pick up a pristine, still-in-box, albeit somewhat dented box, Avid Mbox 3 Pro, so I wouldn't have to take out my Mbox 2 Pro from my usual desktop setup. So now, in one fell swoop, I gave myself a fully native Avid recording system, which I intend to make my modern-ish equivalent to my old cassette rigs, and a Windows 7 machine, and uh, yeah, that is 7 running right now, just wanted to show that it exists, but uh, having a Windows 7 machine to do those wonderfully clunky final edits of Archive on, the ones that we all know and love so well, and indeed the final cut of this video will have been done on this computer, once I hand it off to Ed, of course. But uh, in all seriousness, I still wanted to have a contemporary system on this computer as well, so I could go online and do so with up-to-date stuff. And I initially tried to take this Windows partition and split it, then run uh, dual boot uh, Windows 7 and 10 from the Windows side of things. But I just couldn't pull it off. Uh, something about running too many partitions and confusing the computer and uh, all I can say is a good thing I was making backups through all this. Now, I know I'm kind of throwing around a lot of computer jargon today, but as I've hinted, I assure you, I am not a computer expert. Uh, who'd have thunk it? Uh, yeah, just about everything I do, I have to have a tutorial holding my hand throughout. So, with that, I was looking into what can I do with this uh, after the Windows thing failed. And I saw that some people were taking these MacBooks and triple booting Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. But even with the tutorials, it went way over my head. Plus having to try and learn Linux eventually if I ever got it running anyway. But as it stands, it's just Mountain Lion and Windows 7 and making sure I have my VPN on if I try and take Windows 7 online, which I rarely do. <laughs> I need more techie friends. But anyway, let's take a cut here. We'll take a little look at the Mbox 3 Pro. We'll do just a couple basic demos on it and we'll call it a day. So this guy more or less has the same features and such as the Behringer did, just minus most of the idiosyncrasies. For example, all the channels here are truly independent. None of that split stereo junk that the Behringer had. But uh, anyway, let's just take a quick basic run through of this thing. We've got four potential XLR microphone inputs. The two on the front will also accept quarter-inch cables. The two on the back will not. Then each of these four channels has its own volume control, as you would expect. Plus, if you're recording something really hot level-wise, you can pull the knob to give yourself a 20 dB cut. And then below each volume knob, uh, well, on the first two channels here, you've got a selection between the front and rear inputs. Then on the third and fourth channel, you can switch between mic and line level. And on all four of them, you can trigger some gentle limiting, a uh, soft limit. And uh, yeah, as opposed to putting outright compression on your track. Then we've got four LED meters, one for each input. We've got a multi-button, 
and that's to switch between commands on Pro Tools. And I'm so used to doing everything on the computer proper that I'm sure I'll forget it exists and I don't really care anyway. Uh, then we got the 48 volt phantom power boost for condenser mics, two quarter inch headphone jacks, each with their own volume control, then a button that will alternately dim the LED lights and mute your audio. Then we got a button to switch around multiple sets of speakers if you have them hooked up. And of course, a master volume control knob. On the back, we've got a quarter inch jack for a foot switch. So if you wanna be able to start or stop playback remotely, uh, maybe punch in at a certain point in recording and not have to, you know, reach over to the computer. You can do that. Then, of course, the power switch, the place to hook up the AC adapter. We got a couple of Firewire 400 ports, and I have to use a 400 to 800 adapter because my line of MacBooks does 800. Then we've got six outputs, so you can either run three sets of speakers or one set of 5.1 surround speakers. Then we've got a pair of RCA inputs for a CD player, tape deck, whatever. We got an eighth inch input for an iPod or just something with a headphone jack. Then we've got either four mono or two stereo pairs of line inputs. And in tandem with them, we've got a four dB boost or 10 dB cut button. I keep it at the 10 dB cut. Then we've got four inserts for any outboard gear, uh, compressor, EQ, just uh, if you want to record stuff wet, stuff that, you know, once it's there, it's there. You can't take it out. And of course, we've got our other two XLR jacks and uh, just plain ones this time. But uh, then, yeah, we got to talk about this 15 pin port here because that's the one and only real idiosyncrasy of this thing. So that 15 pin port takes this breakout cable. So on the breakout cable, we've got your MIDI in and output, and uh, you kind of have to have the light hit them just right to be readable. Then, let's see here, we've got, if I can pick out the right ones, got a couple of BNC connectors to hook up a word clock. It'd be nice if the camera would focus. There we go. And then lastly, a couple of RCA plugs and that's for a SPDIF device, S-P-D-I-F. Uh, just another digital audio interface to hook up to this if you're so inclined. The closest to a gripe I have about this thing is I'd prefer a little more variance in color because in the heat of the moment when you're trying to do something, it's nice to have knobs and buttons that stand out, in my opinion, and they just don't really do that here. But uh, as I said, that's a minor gripe, total nitpick. And, uh, okay, moving on. Even though it's kind of redundant, let's close things out on some basic tests. So I'll play you some basic examples of microphone use and things that get plugged directly into the interface. But to actually, before I do that, let me just quickly say that I think it's a massive shame that these are not made anymore and that Firewire isn't really a thing anymore and that these are not supported on, as of my making this, the latest Mac OS and appear to be heading into obsolescence with Windows as well. Uh, sometimes I really question progress. But anyway, let's do those tests, and that'll be it for today.
Okay, just a little check of the Rode NT1 condenser mic. I got the 48 volt phantom power boost going on and my little makeshift uh, acoustic foam fortress going on. I don't have it set up real well, so it might be a little boxy sounding today. But uh, it is archive. I do the box thing quite a bit. But yeah, Rode NT1. And on to my other main microphone, the Shure SM57. Dynamic mic, uh, really the world's most common microphone. Used in probably every recording studio and live rig in the world. Uh, for what it's worth, I have the Phantom Power off right now. Not that that matters with a dynamic mic, but uh, full disclosure. But anyway, that is it for me on the vocal front for today. So let's do those direct input tests. And otherwise, I'll talk to you again soon. <laughs>